Malvern, August 31st, 2024. Let's get into it. It's not often I make back-to-back -back videos. I hope you catch yesterday's video, which was actually posted <laughs> today, August 31st, because it took me all night to make the damn video. You know, when you're cutting and pasting a lot of different clips in there, and I, I know if you if you do watch that video, it got a little choppy towards the end because I, I had planned to include some content, uh, but I couldn't do it, man. Couldn't do it. So the big story for me today is boar's head. I don't know about you, but, you know, we have Publix down here in Florida, and uh, one of the, the meats that I look for, because I thought it was... A better quality meat is the boar's head meat. Well, nine people <laughs> are dead. Now. Can you imagine that you go to the grocery store, you pick up some ham, you bring it home, you eat you a nice ham sandwich, and now you're you're at the pearly gates, dead. <laughs> nine people. I'm not trying to laugh about it. I mean, but I'm just thinking, my God, that could have been me. You know, because I eat a lot of boar's head meat. But that just tells you about these these food conglomerates how dangerous they are to the public i mean here i thought boar's head and, and you know the thing is you would think these corporations you know if they were managed properly that that would be their number one priority because you can you imagine you know that they, they had to it was in virginia i think there was and when they went in there i mean there were roaches crawling around and they found mold and mildew and I mean, the, the place was just completely unsanitary. You know, and if you're, you're managing a company, talk about tarnishing your brand. I mean, it's kind of like when Bud Light <laughs> came out with that commercial, you know, uh, with the, what was that, Dylan? I think that was his name. I don't know. And uh, it totally tarnished their brand and everybody just boycotted Bud Light from then on. I, you know, seriously, I haven't bought a Bud Light since that happened. So... And so now I'm scared to buy a boar's head. I, I, that, but that's the big story for me because I'm thinking, man, I, I'm wondering if I have any boar's head meat down in my freezer. I bet I do. I bet I do. So the, uh, the next story was, and I, I, I cannot verify this. I just heard it on the radio. But they said that 22 veterans commit suicide every single day. You know, if you're a veteran and you're watching this, you know, number one, you know, we got the false valor with that uh, that idiot uh, governor from uh, Minnesota. What's his name? Uh, Tampon Tim. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, so a guy on the radio was talking about how many people claim that they're Navy SEALs. Folks, I was never a Navy SEAL. I was never a Ranger and I was never a uh, recon. I was just a combat engineer in the Marine Corps, light infantry in the Army, uh, electronic warfare in the Air Force. So yeah, I wore many hats, but nothing so glorious as a Navy SEAL or, or a Ranger or Recon. It was, anyway, so I just want to wanna say, I mean, you don't have to claim something you're not, man. But anyway, 22 veterans. So I'm, I'm reaching out to all the veterans who watch this video. The one thing that cured me, or helped me so much, was a doctor, because I was getting, a, and I, there was a guy on the radio, he was talking about all the drugs that the VA was giving him, and that's what the VA solution is to PTSD, they want to drug you up, and all that does is make you even more depressed. Finally, a doctor told me, he says, have you ever tried hiking? I said, well, I like to walk. He says, well, get out. Get out and hike, and then of course I added to it. I'm gonna I'm gonna flip the uh, the camera around here, and I'm just gonna show you what it looks like here. And if this doesn't get your PTSD out of the way, so that you don't want to commit suicide, let's just take a look at this. I'm just gonna keep it on the forest for just a minute, because I'm back out on the trail. We finally got a couple of days of good weather here in Florida, so I can get out and do some hiking on the trails. But anyway, the the thing that I wanted to put on the video yesterday was Tucker Carlson. Because I was trying to show you how uh, they're censoring, you know, everything around the world. Especially uh, X down in Brazil now, that, that war going on. I did the video on that yesterday. Uh, and I, was, I wanted to cover Telegram. Well, 
Tucker Carlson had a hell of an interview with a guy on Telegram, and uh, I was going to put that in yesterday's video, but I couldn't do it because there was so much doggone good material in that video, and I was already up to 40 minutes on yesterday's video, and I'm like, man, I, I can't, I, I don't know where to make my cuts, you know, because usually I just want to show you the part that was relevant to Telegram, but the guy that was doing the interview, it was just an incredible, incredible interview. So what I'm going to do for this video is I'm going to just show you five minutes. And I don't like stealing that much material from anybody. Let me flip this around. My arm's getting tired. Whew, sorry about that. I know, camera all over the place. Huh? <laughs> Are you dizzy yet? But anyway, so um, what's the, let's get five minutes of that Tucker Carlson video right now. So this feels like... Uh, you know, there have been a lot of arrests in the last few years, including a, a number of people I know, you know, get arrested for political reasons. But the jailing of the founder and owner of Telegram feels like a pivot point. It feels like a moment in history and probably a harbinger of, you know, the next few years or decades. I hope I'm wrong. Um, so the question is, like, what is this? How did this happen? France arrests him on a fuel stop. He's a French citizen, by the way but he lives in Dubai, um, arrests him. That's a big step. Very hard for a bystander without direct knowledge, being me, to believe that Macron could or would have done that without the encouragement or at least agreement of the Biden administration. You were the first person I thought of. Um, got you here as fast as we could. So I'm going to just stand back and I would very much like to hear you explain what you think happened in this arrest, how it happened, what it means, who was involved. Well, we don't know yet. Um, and part of what I've been talking about, which is the suspected role of the U.S. Embassy in the arrest, or as, as you put it, I think perfectly, we don't know if it was participation or approval or nothing. And I'll play devil's advocate against my own my own argument here, but I feel compelled to make this argument because we're not getting the answer from the Congress who should be getting it for us, which is to say that an entity like the House Foreign Affairs Committee, if it was committed to free speech, would be interrogating whether or not there was a U.S. embassy back channel to French law enforcement or French intelligence or the French government in terms of doing this, because this is a pattern of practice that the U.S. embassy has pursued all over the world and particularly in Europe. Uh, through you know brands branding like anti-corruption or whatnot, you know, this is something you know even dating back to Norm Eisen when when he was the ambassador to the Czech Republic, you know championing these sort of corruption ref, anti-corruption reforms uh, from the Czech government to arrest the you know the politicians who essentially opposed the State Department agenda. There, this is very common. If you go to places like the Journal of Democracy, which is the academic journal for uh, for the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a very probably the most notorious CIA cutout in the whole arsenal, they have whole academic journals on uh, how to push the Poland government to arrest uh, the politicians from the PIS party, from the Law and Order party, uh, especially in the, in the judicial system. And to arrest them? Yes, yes, to to mass arrest the. We have we have a concept in American statecraft called transitional justice which is this idea that essentially after the U.S. overthrows a country, we make we arrest all of the opposition politicians, opposition judges, uh, opposition journalists, propaganda spreaders, in order to stop the reemergence of threats to democracy. Well, <laughs> no, I'm not joking. You make it a one-party state. So it can be a democracy. Right. Well, this is... Is this China pushing this or the United... Just to be clear. Or the this is the United States. States. This is the United States. And we do that to, to stabilize the democratic institutions and effectively make it cheaper for the United States to manage because you don't need to manage the constant recurring threat of the party you just vanquished. So this is this was something that, that the U.S. State Department was spearheading years before Trump got into office. And it was so effective that these same cast of characters are back for Trump. Norm Eisen was the one who spearheaded you know, the impeachment. He drafted articles of impeachment before Trump was even... Uh, even took the oath of office and also led the, uh, you know, elements of the uh, U the 2019 Ukraine impeachment, uh, the lawfare that's currently being done with the 90 plus felonies against Trump. So this is this is a instrument of statecraft, the use of prosecutions in order to bring leverage against and to 
get rid of pesky people who oppose the State Department's priorities. But in the specific case of Telegram, there's there's a lot going on here. Let me ask you to pause really quick. We could know a lot more about the Biden administration's involvement through the U.S. Embassy in Paris if a single House committee controlled by Republicans would just jump on it. Yes. I think that's what you said earlier. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And the problem is, is our Congress is not sticking up for us as the, as this is happening all over the world. Just this year, you know, the drama around Brazil has been a huge issue for Elon Musk and X. And one, you know, the House held a hearing on it. And then the, the House Foreign Affairs Committee title the hearing was Brazil, a crisis of democracy, rule of law and governance, question mark. They did not interrogate the the U.S. State Department's role in censorship in Brazil. It was actually the U.S. State Department who capacity built, spending tens of millions of dollars, the entire censorship ecosystem in Brazil. They spent tens of millions of dollars paying Brazilian journalists, Brazilian censors, Brazilian fact checkers, uh, even members of the the legal scholarship associated with Brazil's uh, censorship court, and effectively pressured through that NGO soft power swarm, Brazil to set up the entire censorship architecture it now has. They set that up. Why would the U.S. government, which represents the U.S. Constitution and democracy, be trying to end democracy? You can't have democracy with censorship of, by definition. So why would we be trying to end democracy in country after country? Like, What is the point of that? Well, this is one of the great ironies of American statecraft in the post-2016 era, uh, Free speech has been an instrument of statecraft since for, for, for U.S. diplomacy, military, and intelligence purposes since the 1940s. Free speech around the world has been something we've championed, in part because we believe it, but uh, in part, in large part, I should note, uh, because this, this is how you can capacity build resistance movements or political movements or paramilitary movements in countries that the U.S. State Department seeks to attain political control over. Now, wasn't that impressive? Now, I don't know how to put a link into Tuck, because I want you to watch the whole interview. It's like two hours long, you know, and uh, I just just showed you five minutes. But, I mean, you want to get an education about the United States empire uh, and, and the, how we deal with other countries you know, and censor uh, people all around the world. I mean, you'd have to just watch the whole the whole thing. In fact, I don't know, I guess go to Tucker Carlson's channel on X. That's the only thing I can tell you. Uh, or I, maybe I'll go up on TuckerCarlson.com and I'll see if I can, if, look in the description. If I can get a link to that video, I'm gonna put it in the description of this video. The other thing that I didn't show you in that video was Tucker Carlson did an advertisement for parlor. I didn't, wow, I just saw, <laughs> I didn't get it on the video, dog. I didn't, I should have tried to put my mug back on the video. The deer just ran right across the trail. At least I think it was a deer, it could have been a bear. All I saw was a blur and it was kind of blackish rather than brown, so who knows, maybe, I, maybe I'm coming up on a bear. But uh, anyway, he did an advertisement for parlor. Now I've been posting on parlor and I went up to Parler. I mean, Parler, like I said, it was it's coming limping back. But I guess uh, if they're advertising on the Tucker Carlson show, I don't know where the funding's coming from, but I guess Parler's going to be back in a big kind of way. And when I looked on there, I don't... There's no way. It said I had like 5,000 followers <laughs> on Parler. Well, I mean, I had a whole bunch before they took it down back in 2000. But I don't think it was anywhere near 5,000. I, somehow I think Parler's still broken... In some ways, and, and but you can upload videos and media there. So who knows? Maybe all the people that were following me back in 2000 are back following me again, and maybe I'm picking up even more followers there. So maybe Parlor might be a social media platform that you want to take a look at, in addition to you know what's on X or what's on. Um, uh, well, I, I don't recommend Facebook. <laughs> if, you, if you want to go to Facebook, that's fine. I don't. I don't understand why people use Facebook or Instagram or or TikTok. You know, I I don't know. I guess uh, you you do you, man. You do you. I'll see if I can get the next news story here in just a minute. So rather than get my ugly mug on the video, I just wanted you to enjoy the scenery 
I got uh, two two more videos for you. Uh, I don't know if you follow along, but I was talking about the uh, mosquitoes. I've been talking about that for about three videos now. Uh, I don't. I, it's a story that nobody <laughs> is talking about anywhere. Uh, and of course, in Florida, you know, I suppose I get bit by mosquitoes here all the time. I'm doing the fire break now. The danger with doing this is you see all these weeds, they're brushing up on my ankles. And I'm going to tell you, this is Tech Central down here in Florida, so I'm probably, I'll have to keep checking. Luckily, that's why I wear white socks. Uh, i got to keep checking for ticks as I move through the fire break. Well, I guess we're done with this. <laughs> Look at that. No way I can hike through that. Oh, well. Well, anyway, let's, uh, let's watch the, the video on the mosquitoes right now. As teams in New York City and along the Northeast unleash an attack on mosquitoes from the air and streets, health officials in Wisconsin confirming two people have now died in that state from West Nile virus. This morning, nearly 290 cases reported across more than 30 states. The mosquito transmitted illness accounting for 100 to 200 deaths each year. In Missouri, 18-year-old John Proctor VI, now on a ventilator, contracting the disease early this month. His parents say symptoms started with headaches and dizziness, then spiraled into vomiting, disorientation, and a dangerous fever. And to see him lethargic, and struggle to do simple, basic functions, it's hard. The doctors describe this as a marathon to beat this virus since there's no actual cure for it. Many who get West Nile may not ever feel sick, but one out of every 150 people infected may develop serious, even fatal illness. And this morning, concern about another rare but potentially lethal mosquito-borne virus, Triple E, with six people sickened in at least five states. All right, so that was the, the latest uh, video, and uh, th you know I, I I showed you the Twitter account, you know what's it called, Josh Dunlop or whatever, and he's the one that's been posting on that. So and, and I I just follow along, you know. The next one was a uh, an advertisement by the Hooties, and uh, it's pretty damn impressive video. I tell you what, these uh, Arab countries or the, uh, the the axis of evil or whatever you want to call them. They're putting out some good, uh, good material. Let's let's watch that video now. See what I mean? So that was uh, that was crazy. And then uh, there's a a video on on X 
of a black guy talking about, I think he's talking about why he wants to vote for Trump. And uh, we'll probably finish off the, uh, the video here. Let's watch that video now. What's your prayer for 2024? I would say that what we're looking at today is a man, Donald Trump actually, um, who is against the odds. He's against the odds. And the only reason that I can say today that I can still support him is because he's not a politician. He can't be bought out because he already has money. And it seems like the whole world is against him. So for me, I think if America's going to have any chance at all, we better vote for Donald Trump. If anybody else gets in office, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And so my prayer is that, first of all, the church will wake up. The preachers will wake up. And then the citizens of America can hear the voice of what's coming from those who really know God and know what we need in this nation. So that's my prayer for America today. God bless you. Hey, God bless you. Okay, so that was that was the black dude. Uh, by the way, let's get over here. I just want to get some more scenery on this thing. Uh, anyway, everybody's talking about how Kamala blew that interview with uh, Dana Bash. I, I, I did want to say one thing about it. Was And it's funny, man. I mean, because Dana Bash, when she interviews uh, Vance or Trump or, you know, any of these uh, left-wing reporters, I mean, they're like bulldogs, man. They go after them. You know, Vance or Trump, and you know they they're cutting them off, and you know hitting them with you know what about this and what about that, and uh, everybody's talking about it. There's my bench right there. They put that in just for me. Uh, well, we could hike down there. Yeah, let's go on down here. And uh, but you're, you, it was a real softball interview. Well, I, if I think of anything else to add, or if, especially if we see a deer. Or uh, something. I'll add it to the video, but I have a feeling we're done for the day. Peace out and stay free. Okay, I lied. I just thought that was the prettiest view with the sun behind me coming in, looking at that. Isn't that awesome? With the cloud. I always like the clouds in the background there. Anyway, I wanted to show you this trail. Man, I tell you, <laughs> if something came out of those bushes, you, you wouldn't have much time to run, would you? I just got to keep checking for ticks. But I just wanted to get that view one last time. What kind of looks like something out of a Africa or something. Huh. Speaking of Africa, boy, I tell you, the, uh, the, the, um, they're really kicking out the, uh, the United States and France and the colonial powers. Russia is, Russia is moving in, taking over. And when I say taking over, see, the thing is, Russia and China treat Africa with respect. You know, whereas we just go down there and overthrow the governments and put somebody in power to, uh, that's subservient to the United States Empire. And that's why people hate the United States and Africa. And so that's why they're throwing us out. Just wanted to say, but look at this trail. <laughs> Is, it, is this cool or what? I mean, I, I you know, I'm just spending a day. I gotta, I gotta start getting my way back to the car because it's gonna get dark on me. You wouldn't want to be right here in the dark. All right, one more nature pick as I'm making the turn. I, I like it with the sun behind me, so you get to see what I see. Look at all the colors. Amazing, isn't it? One last nature pick. I wanted to show you way off in the distance there. See that fire break goes all the way around the perimeter. And it's beautiful. Because you're hiking right around this. It's too bad we couldn't get that in. It's just too overgrown. But anyway, you can see the trail's looking pretty good for this time of the year. I mean, they, I tell you, I'm not surprised that the county's able to keep this cut. Anyway, I got a comment. I just I forgot to put it on the video about, uh, I took offense that I called the uh, Democrats vacuous meat puppets that would elect a dog if it ran for president, because they are the Borg. They will uh, go wherever the machine tells them to go. And, uh, but he said, ah, oh, that's not true. You know, he says the Democrats have an independent mind. Well, you know what? I just wanted to add this to the video 
Remember Pennsylvania? Remember Pennsylvania? They elected a dead man <laughs> and a zombie. You elected, uh, Democrats elected a dead man and a zombie in Pennsylvania. So don't tell me that a dog couldn't run for president as a Democrat. To kick it off in uh, Russia's uh, Belgorod region, we understand that at least five civilians killed in a Ukrainian attack on Friday evening. Local governor reports Kiev used cluster munitions in the strike. Uh, the official added that several projectiles were also intercepted. And some still managed to hit an apartment building, leaving 46 people wounded, among them seven kids. And earlier, my colleague Michael Kwache spoke with a global security analyst, Cyril Delatre, and he says Kiev has resorted to attacking civilian areas as its forces continue to collapse along the front line. You've been analyzing this thing. You've been, you've been looking and watching and following all of this. What can justify this kind of attack on civilians? Nothing except the terrorist state like the Ukrainian regime is. That's all. Uh, they are so desperate that they are trying to target civilians deliberately just to just hoping that Russia would uh, uh, ans strike back in, in an unreasonable manner to call for something bigger. Uh, so uh, there is nothing that, that can qualify what Ukrainian did, but war crimes, definitely war crimes.